Welcome everyone and thanks for joining us on today's panel discussion webinar, Privacy in a Pandemic, Implementing a Global Framework for Compliance, brought to you by the ITGRC Forum. The ITGRC Forum produces educational events for the governance, risk management, and compliance community, and we provide free market intelligence to all of our members. If you're not already a member, you can register at executiveitforums.org. I'm Kelly Vick, the host of today's program, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Today's moderator is Colin Whitaker. Welcome back to Colin. Colin is the founder and Director of Informed Risk Decisions and has over 30 years' experience in cybersecurity in government and in the private sector. Since retiring from the military in 2001, he took up the role of Head of Security at APAX. In 2010, he became the VP of Payment System Risk at Visa Europe, and in 2015, he went independent and currently provides cybersecurity risk consultancy services to a wide range of public and private companies. Colin has presented on information security at major events around the world and has published a number of papers on security. And on the panel, we have Danielle Cacera, Senior Product Marketing Manager at Okta, Dan Harms, Third Party Risk Consulting Manager at OneTrust, Jason Rolfe, Vice President of Solutions for OnSpring, and Todd Beeler, Senior Vice President of Product Strategy at Process Unity. We'll run through a more detailed introduction with our panel in a moment, but first I'll go over the housekeeping, learning objectives, and the agenda for today's session. First, the webcast is streaming live and all lines will be in listen-only mode for the duration of the conference. If you have any issue with the audio, please first check your device settings before contacting technical support. And we recommend that you paste our direct landing page into a fresh browser window and close any other live windows to avoid conflicts. The direct console URLs are displayed on your screen now and they're clickable in the attached PDF slide deck. We want this to be as interactive as possible, so we've lined up some polls to get your input throughout the session. We'll notify you when the polls open, so please listen for those and submit your response in the box below your console when prompted. Just make sure the console is not in full screen mode or you will not see the options. Also, if you have any questions for our panelists, you can submit these at any time using the question tab and we'll be fielding these throughout. Today's program is approved by NASBA and we'll be providing one CPE credit to qualified attendees. To qualify and receive your certificate, we require that you've completed all fields on registration, answer all of the polls, and rate us at the end. Please use the Rate This tab to submit your rating and comments as we value feedback and take it into consideration when planning future events. For those of you who qualify for CPE credit, certificates will be issued via email within 30 days. If you'd like a copy of the slides, you can download these through the Attachments tab, where you can also access the related white papers and resources at any time during the discussion. And finally, after the live presentation, this webcast will be available on demand, so please share with any colleagues who you think would be interested in the topic. Our learning objectives today are to gain insights on how to improve resiliency around the new risk landscape. Better align global privacy data regulations and enable business agility in a changing environment. Foster greater interplay between executive leadership to make informed decisions. And create successful privacy frameworks that are globally aligned. Moving on to the agenda. We'll begin with speaker introductions before running over some quick tips recommended by our panel. Then we'll dive into the Q&A discussion facilitated by Colin before closing with takeaways and further information at the end. So now, without further ado, I will go ahead and turn the program over for today's discussion. So over to you, Colin. Kelly, thank you very much indeed, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, to start with, I'm going to run around the table, our virtual table, uh, and hear from each of our panelists. I I'm going to invite them to tell us a little bit about their organization and a little bit about themselves. So our audience today, or those coming on later online to listen to it in the archives, can understand the frame of reference where our panelists are coming from today. So, Danielle, without any further ado, we'll start with yourself. Hi, everybody. My name is Danielle Casera, and I'm a Senior Product Marketing Manager at Okta. And I'm responsible for our go-to-market strategy around Okta customer identity products, which essentially is uh, logging in for customers. So many of you may think of Okta as something that you use at work every day to sign into the apps that you use the most. We do the same thing if you're signing in on a consumer website. And so um, I work on a lot of those products. And uh, at Okta, I just sort of explained it, we have two sides of identity, customer identity, which is end user identity and workforce identity, which focuses on employees. Um, so we do uh, try to make logging in easier and more secure for pretty much everybody out there. Well, thank you, Daniel. That's going to be a very important contribution today. Uh, next up, Todd, can you tell us a little about yourself and the work you're doing there at Process Unity, please? 
Sure, Colin. Hello, everybody. My name is Todd Beeler. I'm the uh, Senior Vice President of Product Strategy at Process Uni. So we oversee the uh, product roadmap, our investments in helping our customers automate their risk and compliance uh, initiatives. So I work with our enterprise customers and our mid-market customers to provide levels of automation uh, that they're trying to do with the current challenges that they face in the regulatory and risk landscape. Uh, Process Unity is a, a leading SaaS provider of GRC program automation. Uh, we lead the market in third-party risk and, and help both, uh, like I said, enterprise and mid-market organizations to uh, streamline, automate, and embed uh, risk management and intelligence into their business. Thank you very much indeed, Todd. Um, I'm looking forward to your input today and continuing our conversations that we've had in the past. So on to yourself, Jason. Can you share where you're coming from today with OnSpring? Absolutely. Thanks, Colin. Hi, everyone. My name is Jason Rolf. I am uh, currently the Vice President of Solutions with OnSpring. I uh, started my career in internal audit, which naturally expanded into risk management and compliance. Uh, moved into the software world uh, in, back in 2009 and, and really started by focusing and building and implementing solutions. Uh, currently, I lead OnSpring's solution development and roadmap efforts, uh, our sales engineering and demonstration efforts, and uh, provide a good deal of client support. Um, and, and a little bit about OnSpring, uh, our, our goal is simple. It's really to help our customers do their very best work. How we do that is leveraging our cloud-based no-code platform to deliver solutions or to enable clients to uh, develop their own solutions to uh, best address their problems. Well, thank you, Jason. Uh, and last but definitely not least, Dan, can you tell us a little about the work you're doing there at OneTrust, please? I can. Thank you, Colin. Uh, good day, everybody. My name is Dan Harms. I lead our North America sales and consulting operations here at OneTrust for our third-party risk management offering, Vendorpedia. Um, today, OneTrust is widely known as the industry leader in third-party risk, privacy, security, and compliance management. Uh, we work with over 5,000 customers across the world, both big and small, spanning from Fortune 500s to the small mid-sized business. I spend my time working closely across privacy and security, helping organizations build the fine, repeatable, third-party risk and compliance programs, leveraging our SaaS-based solutions from assessments and due diligence, our cyber risk exchange and database of over 60,000 vendors and pre-built profiles to help source some of the back-end information, uh, as well as the integrations to uh, align internally with other systems or procurement processes that are critical to third-party risk. Well, Dan, thank you very much indeed for that. It's great to have you on, and I'm looking forward to your insights uh, during the discussion today. Uh, okay, everyone, so I think that sets the stage very nicely. Uh, and to kick things off, we've had our panelists identify some quick tips for you, our audience. Uh, and they recommend things such as prioritizing data classification and automation, uh, align your organization with your data, uh, establishing interrelationships of key data elements and leverage those to involve impacted individuals, um, implement a defined repeatable process focusing on real-time data and insights, uh, and refining processes to become more prescriptive through vendor onboarding requirements. Now, I'm going to bring uh, each of our panel in to tell us a little bit more about this. Uh, and I'm going to start with Danielle. Uh, Danielle, privacy is a complicated subject, and I'm sure that's why a lot of people have dialed in for this panel discussion. Uh, it's got lots of moving parts, especially now in the current environment. So what are your quick tips to how to tackle the main problems we're all dealing with? Yeah, we like to think about privacy and consent as a sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs where you need to satisfy the bottom of this pyramid before you can really move up to the top, but each tranche is very important. Um, we also believe that identity is a foundational factor in sort of tying these parts of the pyramid that you see together. So I'll quickly go through each one. First thing that you need to think about before you do anything else when you're thinking about privacy and consent is data classification. So, you know, what is the data? What kind of data is being captured and stored? Is it healthcare? Is it preferences? Is it personally identifiable information? Is it a help desk ticket? What is it, right? Then you need to know where it is. Um, so you need to know what kind of data is captured, uh, find where it's located. Is it in a desktop, a server, a CRM system? It could be in many different places for most companies. And then a question that I don't think a lot of us ask ourselves today is, why do I have it? Um, as mm -hmm. privacy regulations increase, this is an increasingly important question. And I think the er old standard was, let's just collect as much as possible about every customer so that I can use it in marketing personalization and uh, other marketing efforts down the line. 
And that's just not a best practice anymore. And you really do need to ask yourself why you have every piece of data that you, um, that you have. The, the fourth thing is how do I comply? You do have to answer all these other questions before you can truly comply. And that's figuring out what regulations your company is subject to, which is going to be very personal to you. And the very fifth thing is automation. And this is another thing that we believe Okta helps with. But essentially, you want to have repeatable processes for every geo where a regulation pops up. And so we think of having sort of a master process for one geo that you can replicate across others in an automated way as, um, as kind of the best practice that you're reaching for. Thank you for that, Daniel. That's, that's excellent. And I can't agree with you more about uh, asking the question, why do I have it? And it's a very difficult question for marketing professionals to confront when they are trying to ask them why they're keeping all the information about on their customers, uh, as we found out when we were doing GDPR assessments for clients. Dear me. Uh, this leads very nicely into Todd's recommendation, which is to align your organization and your data. So Todd, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, implementing a framework to be able to do this? Yeah, sure, Colin. And, you know, alignment of you and your data is critical today, just as Danielle mentioned, right? Um, first, you have to start, you know, really at understanding your organization. What elements do you have? What inventory is in your business around the application systems, organization, people, uh, policy, third parties, of course, that you have in your business, and how are they interrelated? And then, as, as you know, Danielle even mentioned, with the data classification and identification, how does that data move through your organization? So what classification and types of data do you have, and where do they sit inside of that org? Uh, certainly what we believe and what we talk to our customers and, and help them implement is being able to understand, now that I understand my organization and my data, if I have that understanding as step one, uh, what control framework am I putting in place to make sure that based on the type of data and where in the org it sits, I'm applying the right level of controls to be able to support that? And having your control framework in place to manage your data and mapping those things is very important. What can sometimes trip companies up is where they uh, try to align themselves to too many different standards or regulations down at the bottom directly into their organization. So if you're able to create uh, your own control framework that maps down into things like CSF, high trust, or GDPR, CCPA, obviously, to understand and make sure that you're complying with those regs, uh, but tie those to your, your control framework, it gives you a layer of abstraction so that as the bottom changes there and you have new regs that are always coming in and new standards that you have to be part of because your business has expanded, you won't have to go and remap all of that work at the top because your control framework is doing that for you. And so we really see that, you know, having that ability to manage global privacy and compliance, it starts by having that stable framework in place where you can start to build off of in terms of your automation uh, initiatives. So thank you very much indeed for that. Very clear. Yeah. Um, sure. Jason, in um, Todd's slide, and he mentioned the importance of stakeholders buying into it, um, your tip is about establishing the right relationship between the data and the stakeholders, which I'm sure helps facilitate the goal that Todd mentioned. So can you tell us a bit more about how you go about this? Yes, Todd's slide, because I think it, it really sets up, you know, the appropriate structure. From our standpoint, you know, the, if the end goal, it's always about thinking about the end goal, which is establishing those relationships to make sure that those key individuals who can uh, who can affect the change or, or address the issues are involved. So, you know, effective monitoring is, is just like Todd stated. It's number one, identifying, you know, what is that end goal? It starts with understanding of sort of what's at stake here. Um, and then when we talk about the key relationships, we talk about folding in, obviously, relationships to um, risks and controls. Those are going to be those key data elements, kind of that middle layer that, that Todd was talking about. Um, but, but really, this is also going to be driven by, you know, your own organization's appetite for such things. You know, what are those critical data elements going beyond risk and control to understand in what context do I need to report these things? And then I think kind of also pivoting off of what Danielle said, you know, really making sure that the appropriate individuals are involved. And, and there is where the real impact is, is if, you know, if the proper ownership is established, if the proper individuals are involved, then we've got a, a set of, of clear accountability for who needs to respond, who needs to address uh, things as they arise throughout this, this set of uh, related data. 
Thank you, Jason. That's very clear. Uh, that's great. Um, and last but not least, Dan. Uh, Dan, what are your tips on refining these processes, particularly as they apply to third-party risk management, uh, and how we can become certainly more agile to handle all the moving parts and with the speed and agility that businesses need these days? Yes, Kyle, and I, I think the key word here for many third-party risk programs today is going to be agile. How do you create the agility or enact agility across the third-party risk compliance and, of course, the privacy programs who all work kind of hand-in-hand -hand throughout the enterprise? I think today, in, in light of the pandemic and business resilience efforts, of course, the news coming out of the EU most recently with the invalidation of Privacy Shield and impacting how you're transacting business and processing data or sharing data overseas with some of the third-party vendors. The real need we're seeing from organizations today is truly refining their processes to be more prescriptive through their vendor onboarding requirements, completely redefining the way in which they're conducting the initial due diligence by being preemptive in establishing that defined, repeatable process, really focusing on real-time data insights versus just the reliance on point-in-time assessments. This has long been kind of the Achilles heel for many organizations who haven't had the, the means to develop kind of that repeatable process to truly understand how these third-party relationships are evolving over time. And of course, revisiting these third-party uh, kind of contracts and structured agreements as the regulatory environment is shifting. Dan, that's absolutely great. And I know we're going to dive into that deeper during the Q&A because I'm sure that many people are fascinated with how uh, third-party risk management is going to play out in this new world of um, uh, compliance and relationship to privacy, and particularly as we go through the output of the pandemic. So thank you for that. Uh, I think this sets things up really nicely with those tips for the discussion. Um, so we're going to pause here on the slide with everyone's uh, headshot, the title and affiliations. I think it's always important so everyone listening today can put a face to the voices that they're listening to. Uh, and uh, for the audience, I do want to remind you all this is very much an interactive session, and we'd have some great talent assembled on this panel. So please don't be shy and use the question tab liberally. Uh, myself and the panelists will be monitoring this throughout for your input, and we'll weave that in as best we can um, during the conversation that we're going to have this afternoon. Uh, so to kick things off, let me put, try and put this into a little bit of context. And whether we like it or not, uh, we're currently all participating in making history as we live and respond to the pandemic. I mean, this is going into the history books, folks. Um, for businesses, they have had to respond by being ever more agile to continue to operate and service their customers. Uh, and in responding, they are inevitably confronting the constraints of existing privacy laws and regulations, which they're obliged to maintain compliance with. So there's this huge dilemma, well, or, or indeed the need to strike a balance between two extremes. And those extremes are needing information to be more agile and to protect one's employees and customers, and yet maintain the spirit of privacy regulations within our enterprises. So it's critical for us in the G GRC community to address these issues on the one hand of being more agile and also maintaining the privacy that the regulations require. So, so let's try and use the collective brains of our panelists uh, and use you, the audience, with your probing questions to examine these issues uh, and see if we can help address this dilemma. And I'm going to start with Todd uh, and ask some broad risk questions, and particularly what risk areas, Todd, do you see us becoming the most important now that the first wave of the pandemic is behind us? Yeah, thanks, Colin. That's a, um, you know, it's interesting when the pandemic first happened, we talked to our customer base and we talked to our partners in the market and finding reactions out. And, you know, from the third party perspective, immediately we went to a financial resiliency, right? Uh, who's being impacted by this and can they still deliver the products or services that they've been contracted to do so? Uh, so we saw a switch, you know, where last year it was really focused around information security, standardization, and making sure that uh, things are protected from that perspective. The pandemic sort of put a shift there to say, look, let's just make sure that we have third party solvency and that we're not going to have a disruption through our business line based off of any financial resiliency disruptions that our suppliers may have with us. Um, that being said, the in, uh, on the information security side inside of the organizations, we saw a, a shift from regular information security to all of a sudden remote workforce, right? All of a sudden you have uh, facilities, if you will, taking on a whole new meaning with your work uh, 
your employee workforce working from home. So now every home needs to be protected and you need to understand what type of data is being accessed out of all of these many private networks that are now enabled throughout uh, your organization. So we talked to the CISOs and found that that's where they were really scrambling was to identify new endpoint encryption plans and, and controls and, and control points and monitoring and DLP type uh, initiatives for them to help control that. Uh, so I think remote workforce, we definitely saw it something. And, you know, when you combine that with the factors of the, the GDPR and CCPA regulations, NYDFS, you know, just realizing some penalty, penalties recently uh, against an organization for cybersecurity deficiencies, uh, there's a lot of pressure on the organizations right now to manage these various different risks specifically and be able to plan for next year as they look to say, what did we do wrong in the first three months and what did we do right and how do we improve on that next year? You know, mm -hmm. and I do see that uh, cybersecurity and third party risk and uh, resiliency are going to be key factors to that moving forward. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And the importance in that yeah. context of knowing how well you did is baselining where you were before you started, which is also critical for the businesses. And I think some, some find it a challenge. Um, thank you for that, Todd. Um, as we become more agile and uh, business structures evolve and change in response, uh, I get a sense that we need to put more effort into understanding what data within the business is becoming more or less important. So Jason, what are some of the critical data relationships I should be considering, or would you be advising our audience? Uh, what information should one seek to gain from establishing what these relationships are? Yeah, Colin, that's a great question. And you know, I think you know, I, I've I've always been a big fan of the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I, I loved that book, and and the first one is really begin with the end in mind. So I think. Uh, that's really, to me, the most important place to start. You know, what are you ultimately responsible for? And I think Todd did a great job of pointing that out, you know, kind of the shifting of the risks and the, the shifting of those areas of interest. You know, are you responsible for regulatory compliance? Is it the health and safety of people? Is it business resiliency or, or you know, third-party uh, third relationships? So ultimately, setting up what those key data relationships are does start at the top there, and that's certainly going to drive – uh, not only the top of the data set, but but where you go from there. And then it really does become a question of asking those those W questions, the who, what, where, when, right? These are the things. How do I achieve this regulatory compliance? When am I required to report on this? You know, what what is something within my, my third-party ecosystem that could cause some level of concern? So if we understand what those objectives are first, then we understand what those key drivers or those key components are that, influence those objectives from there we can go down you know to the lower level which which might be more tactical or operationally focused and in understanding what are the specific things that the organization uh, is doing or in some cases is not doing uh, to um, to meet those objectives making sure that there's relationship to the sort of the set of individuals who are ultimately responsible for that as well so kind of starting at the top and leading your way down into you know kind of the nitty gritty is is sort of the a good way to at least frame how to establish those key data relationships well thank you for that jason i think it's uh, very important it was because one of the data relationships that i think uh, emerged from the pandemic uh, is for the need from enterprises to have a greater degree of care for the health of their staff and their customers. My, my, I've certainly seen that by now going to restaurants. When restaurants, you turn up and they want all your details so they can contact you if there's an outbreak or and, and so on. So this is becoming quite uh, an important new issue for all sorts of enterprises to continue. Uh, and therefore, linking all these issues to maintaining an identity relationship is going to be important. So identity could become a key issue for lots of organizations to address. So, Danielle, from your perspective, organizations today are having a tough time with data organization, classification, and mapping. So, can a focus on identity, for example, using your pyramid, actually help with these problems? Yeah, so we think about identity as a source of truth, really, and I'm sure that that is an overused term in most people's lexicons, but uh, I, I do think it holds true here. It's very difficult logistically. Uh, and operationally to map all of the data that you have in your organization or to take action downstream with auditing if you don't have it all tied back to something central. And a really logical central thing to tie it back to is identity. 
you know, you can't really protect an end user's privacy if you don't know who they are. And so we have a customer who, for example, uses Okta as a source of truth and actually obfuscates uh, the identity of the person. So they know the identity in Okta, they have a user profile, and then they um, actually tie a number to that user. It's an identifier, essentially. And they push it to downstream services like Marketo or like Salesforce or um, even our partners on the call, OneTrust. We have a good amount of people who are very excited about using Okta and OneTrust together because OneTrust is very strong with data mapping and classification and auditing. And tying that all back to an identity makes, makes a lot of sense um, logistically. So that's kind of how we think about how identity plays in here. Thanks very much indeed, Danielle. Um, we've already mentioned the issue of third parties, and uh, actually it's a, it's a continuing theme um, for our GRC event. Uh, third party management is critical uh, and it's becoming increasingly challenging, as, as we were mentioning earlier. Um, and it'd be foolhardy for us not to address this in this webinar again, uh, particularly in addressing privacy and resilience issues in relation to the pandemic. So we're going to have our first audience poll to get our audience input on what percentage of vendors, suppliers, service providers, et cetera, et cetera, are not, and I repeat, not adhering to the contractual requirements that you, your enterprise, place on them. Um, the vote is going live now, uh, and input your response just below uh, when you're uh, – just make sure the slide's not in full screen mode when you're putting your response in, or you won't see the options. Um, remember, we require your input to provide your CPE credit. Uh, and while you're answering the question, I'm going to turn to Dan, because he's the third-party risk management expert. So, Dan, what type of assessment questions can organizations ask their vendors and suppliers during this health crisis to measure resilience, then? Yeah, this is a really good question and something we work very closely with with many of our clients on today. Naturally, there's been the introduction of your pandemic assessments that organizations are now including as part of the initial due diligence or some of that scheduled reassessment of the third parties in which they're uh, currently conducting business with today. The real challenge we're seeing and kind of the construction of assessments and questionnaires for businesses come down to the financial solvency of the organization. Now, this is really easy perhaps easier with your publicly traded organizations where there's a ton of information out there from Dun & Bradstreet or other third-party data sources that can assist with kind of credit worthiness and of course kind of mm -hmm. the financial status of these third parties. The big challenge is with some of the smaller third parties that organizations are using today to service this work from home new normal. Uh, so organizations that may not have the most robust security third-party risk program may not be public with their financial details here, need to make sure you're asking very, very specific questions around from a security perspective. They don't have, you know, third-party certifications like their ISO certificates or SOC 2s, pen test results from an external consultant, that you're continually following up and the vendor understands that you will be checking in with them periodically, whether that's quarterly, whether it's every six months or so, to retain updates to ensure they're making progress as part of that commitment to the business uh, and that contractual agreement itself. So again, a lot of changes. And again, this kind of goes back to the initial quick tip that I offer, just the agility of a third-party risk program. We're continuing to evolve just the way we assess third parties today. Uh, we cannot rely on static assessments by any means. I certainly can't. Um, Dan, the, the people are, uh, the audience are kindly responding to the poll. Uh, have you got any observations on, on the poll? Uh, is this in line, for example, with what you're seeing uh, from the customers and your clients who you're speaking to? Yeah, the, the polls are always really interesting here. Um, as we look at some of the data that's coming through here, it looks like right around the majority of answers are falling in the between 10 and 25% of the vendors or third parties, service providers mm. are not adhering to their contractual requirements. Um, when it comes down to resiliency and business continuity efforts here, SLAs are critical. Uh, so many times organizations we're working with today, this is priority number one for them, is understand how they can manage and track the SLAs and hold their third parties accountable. So no surprise there. Uh, actually, I. Uh, it's interesting not to see that number increase a bit more from that 10 to 25% mm. range. 
Uh, the other piece when it comes to things like your DPAs and uh, other data protection agreements here, I think a lot of this is in flux. Uh, again, with the SHRIMS 2 announcement and moving away from data transfers from the U.S. to the EU with using Privacy Shield as kind of that legal transfer mechanism, uh, organizations have to go back and get standard contractual clauses or adhere to some other type of legal basis in which they can transfer that information to the EU. Um, so again, there's a lot of moving parts right now, both from the third party risk, the security, the legal side, on how they're managing these relationships. So um, yeah. interesting to see interesting. that we don't see a few more uh, bump up in the numbers of that 50% range. Yeah, well, I'm also surprised this one is a 1% and the 75% to 100%. <laughs> to me, to me, uh, I wonder if, uh, how long that contract has you got to run, actually. <laughs> Which I thought, never mind. Hopefully um, it's ending soon. Uh, yes, hopefully it is ending soon, yeah. Um, GRC is um, a support and, uh, and certainly not a leadership function. It's there to help people in the C-suite make um, informed decisions. Uh, as much as any of us might wish to make those decisions for them, of course, um, we provide their full support. Um, we should have asked, also ask, you, I think, the audience, who's responsible in their enterprises for these issues? So we're going to run a second poll now, and the second poll is about who owns cybersecurity compliance within the organization. And I find these sorts of questions really uh, instructive on, on different appetites for who should be in charge in organizations. Um, is it the CISO? Is it the CIO? Is it the Chief Compliance Officer, or a Chief Risk Officer, or a Chief Privacy Officer? Um, so that part, uh, poll is going live. Um, and we'll be active for a minute or so while you respond. And remind you all again that you do need to respond if you want your um, uh, credits for your CPE uh, qualifications. Um, and while that's taking place, I'm going to turn to um, um, Paul, uh, to Todd. Uh, Todd, um, executive leadership needs information to make informed decisions. You made that clear. I'm very clear of that myself. What global privacy and compliance strategies are you seeing your clients develop um, to solve this sort of dilemma? Yeah, no, but, you know, and, and it, it really, you know, it started, you know, GDPR kind of started this privacy campaign, I think. It's been around for a long time, of course, but, you know, where marketing and consumer data approaches are tactical to be able for companies to go in there and they can immediately address something, fix something, and do something. But um, as privacy has expanded and as its reach has expanded and as more uh, countries and jurisdictions and, and global requirements are now crossing borders, uh, we definitely see organizations taking a bigger view on privacy uh, and a bigger view on their compliance to understand, you know, what types of, if we don't have data governance committees, if we don't have risk committees in place, if we don't have a roadmap being developed to support sustainability, then we need to get going on that. Um, it's definitely a cross-functional, uh, you know, uh, uh, requirement where we talk to a lot of our CISO uh, customers and in the market, and, you know, they're trying to work with their chief privacy officers to understand who's going to own this. Obviously, the CISO owns a lot of this data, uh, owns the, the movement of this data and the protection of the data. So they are a key uh, flag that we've seen as the primary owner, and they want to be able to help share those requirements and collaborate tightly with the chief procurement officer. So there's a lot of the development. You know, we talked to a lot of different industries. We, we're big in financial services. Um, but we look at it, all the other highly regulated markets, and it really uh, is a developing organizational structure, right? We see the CISO is elevating in their responsibility and role, uh, being much more cross-functional and engaging, not just in terms of security, but in terms of people, awareness, training, and driving policy uh, decisions. So uh, it's, it's been an interesting thing to see how these executive teams are looking to work together to define the organizational structures, but also the data collection mechanism for which they can make those decisions is really important. Thank you for that, Todd. Um, and yeah. In response to the poll, uh, I noticed yeah. that uh, CISO comes in first, which one might expect, and then the CIO. What, one of the challenges I see in Europe um, frequently is that people designated as CISOs are subordinate to the CIOs. Um, is that something you see in the U.S., and would you be concerned about that? 
It, it is. We do. We see the CISO. You know, the CIO is in charge of information, right? Um, but the CISO's range is more broader than that and actually is acting as somewhat of a checkpoint within the, the function of the CIO. So we do see uh, CISOs, uh, in some cases, they're leveling up uh, onto the same uh, line structure, reporting line structure. In other cases, we're also seeing the CISO go over underneath compliance. Um, so there is some different approaches out there that have been evolving. You know, it's, the CISO's role is very interesting right now in that there's a large set of responsibility on them to be able to articulate and communicate to the board committees and governance factions and regulators uh, English, speak, you know, under, easy to understand uh, uh, complicated topics. And so they yeah. need that strength underneath them to be able to drive it. But th this is pretty pretty common from what I'm seeing as well. And we do see that the, the CISO, the way I say it, the CISO's role is on, is on the rise in this case with, with uh, all the different requirements they have to they have to provide. Just one final observation. It's one of the audience has asked a question. They said, uh, do you think the chief data officer, chief data officer, sorry, has a place in this compliance effort? Yeah, absolutely. And, you, you know, it's, it's evolving the way that people are assigning these and are they actual uh, real roles in departments, or are they a role underneath a, di a given role, right? Um, but absolutely, this level of collaboration that's required to manage the privacy, the regulatory and compliance, and the, and the cybersecurity and information security components to this, uh, make, make it for a fabric across the enterprise that uh, all those players have to be communicating effectively and looking at the same set of data to make those accurate decisions. Thanks very much for feeding back that, Frank. Uh, yeah, sure. um, the, the scoop of the panel is on privacy and identity uh, and our individual desire or legal rights to have certainly identity protected are clearly important starting points for any privacy strategy. Um, so what should we say to our C-level execs about this identity issue? And, and therefore, Daniel, I'm going to turn to you and ask, how should people think about identity in the context of end user, both employee and customer privacy? Yeah, so identity is the gateway to every omni-channel experience. It's the first place where you interact with a brand. So it's where you log in, it's where you register, it's where you end up typing a lot of information about yourself. And I think we've probably all had the experience where we try to log in to United and we have to answer the two security questions that they have um, at least it's definitely a thing here in the U.S. They've had the same two security questions for about a decade. And uh, those are like, what color was your childhood home and what winter sport do you like the best? Not only are security questions like that not the best way to protect somebody's identity during the login experience, uh, they're easily hackable. And the, or they're essentially not the best security standard out there. And when people are typing in, in information about themselves, that information can be stolen. And so when you think about identity in the context of sort of end user security and privacy, um, yeah, I think about it really as that, that first place where you interact with a brand and get a perception of a brand. Uh, the, the other thing to note there is that because users are much more sensitive about privacy today, they get their sense of a brand from how much you ask of them, right? So if they feel like, they have to give you a bunch of information that doesn't make sense for you to know. So for example, I've had online interactions with a hairdresser and I had to type in my address. Does it really make sense for them to have that information about me? Do, and do I trust my hairdresser to be using the sort of best security standards? Probably not. And so <laughs> not only are users much more sensitive, but obviously the user experience really matters when people are registering. And uh, any friction in the process is likely to make them drop off. So there are kind of two components there, user experience and security, and uh, both have a, a lot to do with privacy. And privacy, I think, is central to how people view your brand today. They want to know that you're protecting them. And um, so, yeah, I, I, Colin, did that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely does. Thank you, da uh, Danielle. I, I mean, I can't agree more about some of the people who are now gathering our uh, identity information and whether they have the competence to protect it. It has to be a concern for all of us. Um, one, one of, we're going to move on to try and give some tips and more guidance and more instructive things for uh, our audience in response to some of these challenges. And I think one of the key things is aspiring to 
uh, be more, more, more mature in making decisions and compliance within our enterprises. Um, but how would you rate your maturity now? I, I, it's starting point. You know, if you're going to grow in maturity, you need to know where you're growing from. Um, therefore, we're going to have another poll, uh, and we'll, we'll try your input once more for your um, CPE credits. And the poll is going to be about how would you rate your organization's maturity level in terms of its ability to demonstrate and communicate key regulatory risk and compliance interrelationships. And I'm guessing for Danielle's hairdresser, that would be pretty low. Um, <laughs> Uh, again, input your response in your box below for your console um, and uh, follow the same process as previously. And while you respond to that, uh, let's try and give some guidance on how one can improve maturity, to grow maturity. So, Jason, I'm going to turn to yourself now. Um, if my organization is in an immature or basic state or in terms of how we manage regulatory risk and plans, what steps should your enterprise take to advance its overall maturity? Yeah, great question, Colin. And I think the first most important thing when we talk about the maturity of a process or the maturity of your organization, right? Maturity is one of those kind of loaded terms, and, it, and it's certainly relative. It's going to be relative to the organization you work in. It's going to be relative to the tools you use and, and to your own experiences. So I think that's a really important point to make is that it's just one of those things that can mean different things to different people. But I think the goal is the same is kind of moving to that optimized state where we can, you know, place a great deal of reliance uh, around these relationships, around the systems where we maintain them to bubble that information up to us. So really, how do we advance? How do we make that? Well, the first thing and most important thing is to remember that, number one, there's powerful in things, I'm sorry, there's power in things that are seemingly basic or seemingly simple. Um, the simplest sets of data can really provide a lot of great insight. Um, and from there, it's also important to realize that, you know, prog uh, this progress that you make on this journey, uh, it can be incremental. Um, it's just most critical to, to understand what that ultimate goal is and how can we make those, in, uh, those incremental improvements. So if you adopt that mindset, you know, really it's about first establishing the most basic fundamental elements. If I'm going to achieve even basic uh, achievement of, of uh, with my goals or, or accomplishment of my goals. What is the, the the base level of data that I need to have? But from there, then you can start doing things like expanding the data sets, introducing new data elements that that can lend key insights. Start involving a wider set of individuals. You know, start bringing folks from the business or, or the owners of these controls or these risks or these processes. Um, into a centralized location, you know, and, and obviously keeping in mind the, the points that Danielle makes about understanding who it is and, and what's their need to know with this information, um, and certainly seeking opportunities to leverage technology to automate where it makes sense. Um, but always remaining focused on the primary goal, I think, is the, the best sort of foundational approach you can take to, to looking to improve your, your overall maturity with any process or with any, you know, uh, any venture that you have. That's excellent. Thank you for that. What's your thoughts on the polls? I think it's, I'm, I'm pleased to see that I think many of our audience think they're in the, at least in a managed state or moving towards defined state. Um, is that what you tend to see out there in the uh, with your clients? Yeah, yeah, Colin, I agree. Number one, I am also encouraged. I'd like to see kind of that that big chunk, you know, it's a well about 80% that sit right in those middle two levels. So that that is certainly what we we're anticipating, right? There's there's some level of definition, mm. there's some level of control around that. But you're absolutely right. Um, you know, for those that are in, that are in the optimized uh, world, I, I commend you, and and I, I realize that it was not probably a very easy effort to get to that point. Um, and certainly, I'd be interested to hear kind of some of your thoughts there. And for those of those in the basic. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, the, the things you're doing are probably right. You're doing all the right things. What I sense is that maybe there's a, a an opportunity to just get a little bit more control over, you know, the data that's driving you or the data that is that is resulting from those processes. But, no, Colin, I agree. I kind of expected, you know, sort of that, that middle, those middle two options to, to probably be the, the most robust. But the good thing is, is I, I would suspect if we ask the same question in, you know, six to 12 months, with with increased focus, you could see those numbers. We just had another person. We went up to seven percent optimized, so that's good. Yeah, very good indeed. So thank you. Yep. Thanks for the feedback on that, Jason. Thank you. Um, 
Right. In addressing compliance obligations, uh, we're talking about privacy uh, compliance uh, particularly, one of the starting points on the maturity growth curve is to start with tick boxes. I mean, I've seen thousands of organizations use tick boxes, but I think we'd all agree this has limitations. And, and therefore, uh, Dan, I'd like to turn to you and, and see if you can help prize out. Um, w with the pri various global privacy and compliance laws, how can a firm work towards a comprehensive compliance framework rather than check the box for requirements of each separate law? I, one of the um, audience asked the question about whether there was some standard registry for all the laws and regulations that one could refer to. This is a really good question here, Colin, and I, I think at a high level, the way this question needs to be addressed for organizations trying to define that comprehensive compliance framework, again, keyword there being comprehensive, this starts at the leadership level, from a board, the executive team, this has to be a cultural shift from the top down to the first line, to the second line, to the third line, lines of business here, different business functions, that this is now going to be the way that the organization operates. Um, I think over the past, I'd say, 24 to 36 months, we're seeing organizations move away from that check the box, check the box, excuse me, uh, compliance type of activity here and now trying to take that holistic look at their organization, where their exposure is, where they can leverage some of the existing processes, procedures, um, different controls they have in place. Now, in terms of tips to, to work toward that comprehensive compliance framework, once more, one of the biggest components here is just the awareness within the organization itself. So having a structured security, privacy, awareness training that goes out on an annual basis to make sure the first line is aware of what their obligations are when it comes to respecting consumer data, which really is the premise of these global and regulatory privacy laws themselves. You know, more importantly on top of this, you're starting to see different industry frameworks and standards introduce privacy-focused metrics. So things like the NIST Privacy Management Framework, while still in its infancy stage here, a lot of organizations are looking for codes of conduct, looking for standards in which they can map the business to. And this will get there in time. I think most privacy uh, executives that we're working with today understand it is relatively young. Uh, you also have ISO with their privacy 27701 certification to see extension of 27001 that helps certify the organization is again aligning from a privacy perspective. Um, in addition to that, just the proliferation of use of third-party technologies, whether it's something like OneTrust or Process Unity or OnSpring, there's a hundred different solutions out there that can help structure this data together and help mm -hmm. deduplicate any efforts from a GPR to the Brazilian LGPD to India to Australia to CCPA to the many additional ballots that are now being introduced across states uh, here domestically as well. So you can re-leverage and use the, you know, kind of the processes you have in place today to satisfy requirements to really build that culture of change and alignment to just global privacy, regulatory, and overall compliance. Yeah, it's a real challenge, isn't it, trying to teach your way through some of these regulations. Uh, I mean, many of them are all saying the same thing, but in slightly different ways, and it's trying to tease out what the substantive differences might be. Uh, but it is a challenge, and I think we all have to work harder at doing that, and certainly sharing insights where we can on our global compliance forums about what those subtleties might be. Um, thank you for that, Dan. Uh, in some respects, I think our enterprises may have been more mature than we thought um, in response to Jason and part of yourself, Dan, um, than they were before the pandemic. Um, I think one key example is the ease of adoption and the exponential growth in remote working is a superb example of how agile businesses have become and how um, mature they were taking on new technology. So we've got the um, fourth and final poll now, um, and it's all about remote working. And it's going to ask you basically how many of you feel their organizations is more equipped for remote working than perhaps they actually expected. Um, the poll is again live on your console, so please select your response. And, and while you do that, I'll turn to Danielle. Um, Danielle, a chance to provide you with some more thoughts on tools that you might help uh, might help enterprises maturity grow. So how do you think uh, about which tools you should use to solve some of the problems you've already mentioned? Uh, I mean, does that to do all the stuff or are other people out there doing things that you would recommend? 
Uh, what should a privacy stack look like fundamentally from a technology and procedural standpoint? Yeah, so, so to echo Dan, I think you have a lot of that stack on that call today, or on this call today. And we think about it as, um, I, I don't want to be too repetitive, but echoing what I said earlier, it's having a source of truth and then thinking about downstream technology that flows from there. So your privacy stack uh, from a logistical sort of operational perspective, uh, we think you need an identity provider that doesn't have to be Okta, but you want somewhere that you are looking at identity first and tying those identities downstream to different privacy, um, uh, either software or in general to be able to comply with regulations you want to know the identity of the person, right? So you need to be able to pull user information, for example, if there's a data deletion request or a data retrieval request from an end user. It's hard to execute on a request like that if you don't know where that data is mapped, who that person is, um, and starting that mapping process with a single identity and looking at that across systems is, we think, the best way to do that. So um, the first kind of core core aspect there is an identity provider. The second thing I think that you need to think about is all of the other aspects that you need to think about when it comes when it comes to compliance. So that could be uh, auditing, for example. There's also uh, a lot having to do with preference management. Um, even the sort of logistical aspects of complying with these regulations like data mapping. There are different vendors that can help you do that in a more automated way or in a more structured way. And so uh, vendors like the ones on this call, um, we partner with OneTrust at Okta. There are a lot of other options out there. It doesn't you know, necessarily matter which vendor you choose, but you need to be thinking about identity. You need to be thinking about preference management and um, how you're allowing those preferences to flow downstream and also allowing people to have autonomy over their preferences. So when they uh, decide they want to delete their data or retrieve their data, you can execute on that request, um, as well as having all of the logs there for auditors. You, you really need to think about technology that's going to help you with all of those things. And based on what our customers do today, a lot of it lives in spreadsheets. A lot of it is manual work. None of it is really tied together. And so I think, you know, most organizations are in the first few steps of this process today, but it really does make sense to outsource some of this manual work and allow your team to focus on what they're, what they're really good at. Thanks, Danielle. What's your views on the panel, on, on the poll? I, I think uh, it seems that most of our audience seem to have been somewhat dumbfounded by the competence of their own organization. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, this is actually a uh, common, I, I've asked this on a lot of calls recently, and people constantly are, are saying, wow, we are, we're actually much more equipped for this than we expected. And I expected the answer to be no at the very beginning of all of this, and, and I think it's pretty heartening that technology has allowed people to feel a little more secure than they thought. Yeah, I, I absolutely go along with you, and I was talking to one of my clients about this as well. Um, in the financial services sector, and the, 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 everyone's absolutely amazed how easy it has been to work remotely, securely, and account for the identity of the individuals through the technology they already have. So, yeah, it, it's it's a pleasure to see that actually we're more equipped for this, these sort of things than these sorts of pandemic issues than perhaps we originally thought. So, thank you for that. Um, one of the important factors that has changed since the pandemic is uh, how we respond to crisis events and maintain resilience. Uh, not least with the level of demand of key services that contribute to making us resilient. Uh, so, Todd, how are organizations that you're talking to looking to improve their resiliency around this new risk landscape? Yeah, Colin, you know, I was in March, before, right before the pandemic, I was actually in London at a risk conference listening to the Bank of England talk about uh, resiliency and how in a panel with yeah. them. And, you know, interesting that uh, everything that's unfolded since then really backs up uh, their conversations and what they've been working towards. So, uh, you know, it, it's hard for organizations to put a real resiliency plan in place. It's You can't have silos of, of risk data that aren't interrelated anymore because you, you need to understand that, yes, your third parties are critical to your business, but so are your people. 
So are your, your assets, your high value assets in your organization, you know, your systems, your facilities, your, your applications, and, and your, your people, of course, and the processes that you have and how they're interrelated. So we're really seeing, you know, organizations taking a look at the resiliency by saying we can't just have a, a third party risk uh, without mapping that into the rest of our organization, whether that's uh, mapping uh, a given system or a process and understand what are the key assets that that process uses, who are the key people that that process uses, and then which third parties are supporting that so that in the event of a business disruption, we then very quickly can understand the impact and implement our resiliency plans in effect for that. So the one thing that I took away from, from that conversation with the Bank of England certainly was the risk-based prioritization of this is critical, right? Knowing your critical functions in your business that are needed to operate and the different and monitoring the change across the different elements that make up that particular business function or process is, is really a key component to doing that. And so we're helping our customers uh, tie those things together so that you have that um, understanding as you look at, uh, you know, year over year, how do I manage my resiliency planning? Because the thing about resiliency planning is, you have to manage the change, right? Um, your business is going to change, the landscape is going to change, and you need to be ready for the unknown. And the best way to do that is to know how your business operates and all of the key factors that are inside of it uh, and how you're going to manage those in the event of a disruption. Yeah, absolutely true. I'm glad you enjoyed the um, Bank of England's Not Resilience um, uh, conferences. They're really good value. Uh, and I know they're particularly yeah. getting very concerned about it. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, sure. uh, clearly, resilience is one side of the equation. We've all got to be, respond, uh, be able to res uh, respond because sometimes crisis happens uh, and we all have to deal with it. Um, and it may impact our staff or clients mm -hmm. and what we do. Uh, but it may have changed since because of the pandemic and the way we're now working. So, Jason, so what sort of events or incidents should drive notifications or alerts and who should be involved in addressing them? Yeah, Colin, uh, that's it, it's probably sensing a theme with me here, but obviously the, the answer to this question is going to depend on, you know, the nature of the objective that the alert relates to, right? So um, it, it's just one of those things of, of determining, you know, why is this important? And based on why it's important, uh, who does it need to go to is, is ultimately the question here. So categorizing these items appropriately is, is really, uh, really important in this, in, in, when considering this question. And I really like what Todd said about, you know, the, the, the era of silos is dead. If you don't have uh, a good uh, sort of interrelated data set, then you're not going to have very much success in, in making sure that all involved parties are, are kind of being made aware of the, the issues or the things requiring their attention. So really uh, uh, defining that clear responsibility is going to set you up for success here. So again, if it's a regulatory change, for example, if you're going to want someone who has that sort of experience and or has the insight into what that, that particular regulation is in place for and, and what activities the organization has in place to meet those so that we can make sure that the downstream notifications are given. Um, you know, it's, it's not necessarily that every single person needs to be involved or aware of every single thing that's happening. It's the whole racy chart concept, you know, the uh, responsible and, and accountable and so forth. Having that sort of understanding in, in each of these scenarios is certainly going to be important. Um, in some cases, you're, you're definitely going to need to be reliant, um, you know, on a third party for uh, critical action when, when certain things come up. Um, and I think Dan has given some really good advice in terms of being able to constantly vet and, and evaluate and prioritize those critical relationships. And, and that's where it kind of gets back into that whole evolution of assessment. So understanding who your critical third parties are and who needs to be notified or engaged to help uh, is, is a somewhat of a moving target, right? But it's, it's something that, that needs to evolve along with your, your whole program. Um, and then certainly there are situations where uh, customers need to be uh, informed. So again, I, I realize it's hopefully not too much of a cop out, but truly the the nature of that alert, the nature of the objective that that alert is tied to, is, is really kind of that that foundation or that starting point to determine who really needs to be engaged in this situation. Thank you very much, Steve Jason. Um, I'm going to turn to Dan now because um, he's an expert on third parties. Third parties have always been a key consideration during a crisis event, given that 
Given that the pandemic may now have forced on us to rely on them even more, the service level pressures or threats to them increase then. So Dan, how does third party risk management fit into a firm's crisis management framework? This is a, this is a very broad question, Colin. Um, when you typically think about crisis management for you know, the large enterprise or even the small and medium sized business, uh, well, there's many different components to crisis management, as we know. Traditionally, when we think about, uh, again, crisis management, this is information governance, information security, incident management, all living underneath kind of the organizational risk or enterprise risk domain. Something that I've asked our clients um, through several different implementations is when they're looking at risk to the business today, if they look back, let's say, 24 months ago, and we could even say 12 months ago, when they're looking at the probability of a global pandemic actually happening and what that risk impact is going to be, or what your potentially could be to the business, uh, we have to believe that would have been extremely, extremely low. Now, with that being said, when we start talking about third-party risk management and the shift, the reliance on so many different third parties for work from home and, again, just the reliance on, on these different service providers, when it comes to crisis management for organizations, it's truly understanding, one, kind of the risk profile of the business, the business criticality, conducting your business impact assessments against kind of your internal business processes, what's most critical, most revenue generating on that side there. And then looking at the third parties who, again, assist in kind of the processing of information in support of these different activities themselves. Now, from there, this is really where you start diving into, you know, stack ranking your third parties from you know, high, medium, low risk, or based on a risk on probability and impact type of methodology or mapping on this piece here. But third parties more than ever are playing such a critical role in the reliance of services to businesses well before the pandemic, but of course, even more so today. Um, so again, third party risk management certainly is ever evolving here, I think, uh, everyone today has given some great advice and some best practices around what businesses should be thinking about. But third-party risk management as a whole, again, plays a critical role when it comes to crisis management, whether it's privacy breach notifications and responding to these third parties or what their obligations are, following up on service level agreements, data obligations of a contract was ending, does the organization or third party have to return data back to your business? You know, what's the time frame on that? And you have to have these processes in place, very much so when it comes to, you know, crisis management, incident management from a third party risk perspective. Thanks very much indeed for that, Dan. Um, Daniel, I'm going to turn to you. We've got a really good um, um, audience question here, which I think is right up your street in relationship to what Octa provides. Uh, and it's basically asking, as a customer, as me, an end user, how do you balance between privacy and convenience? So you mean for you, like how do you yeah, find... Yeah, and how does that impact your enterprise in trying to deal with customers' expectations? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think if you're an end user and you're trying to balance privacy and convenience, you need to be very selective in the things that you use. So for example, I have certain standards regarding the way that I sign into things or, or when I'm paying online, how I choose to do it. So um, I think Apple is a very trustworthy uh, way to log in and they now have sort of an Apple ID that you can use and you can decide whether you wanna share your email or your personal information or not with the downstream service that you're signing into. I think organizations like that that give you autonomy over how much information you're providing when you sign in are creating the best standards out there. Um, I would say, you know, Google does not do the same thing. It's collecting data about you and um, it's sending that to third party services. Facebook is quite similar. And so you see those buttons when you're signing into various, many, many websites today. I think, you know, sign in with Google, sign in with Facebook, and you know, mm -hmm. basically, those services are using sign in with Google and sign in with Facebook because they get third party information about you from those services if you use those sign ins. So I you know it's it's odd because it's like Google might be better at actually protecting your identity when you're signing in because they are 
uh, very good at that, and yet they are sharing information about you. So as a consumer, you kind of have to be aware of that and make your own personal decision when you're signing into the stuff. I, I also think about um, – uh, actually, another point about that, I – I think signing in with Google, signing with Facebook, those third-party sign-ins are becoming less of a best practice. Um, I think Apple is actually probably creating the new best practice around that uh, because of that weird brand interaction that the consumer has when they're logging in. Do they trust Google? Do they trust Facebook? Who knows? You don't know. No. And if you're putting that in front of your consumer to sign into your brand, you're creating sort of a second brand experience, which is odd, yeah. and you may not be protecting them. Um, the last point I'll make is around payments. Uh, often I try to sign in and pay with PayPal just because I know that it's not really sharing my payment information with the online provider. Uh, and hopefully there, you know, more services offer something like that. But yeah, making the best personal decisions for yourself, you, you really have to think about it when you're interacting online. And I suppose therefore the challenge is making our customers more informed about what uh, the options are and the benefits in that way and how we make it uh, you know, if we if we were talking earlier on about making technical information palatable to the board, it's how do we make te technical information palatable to Mr. Joe's blogs in the street to make him make a better informed decision, isn't it? It's that sort of challenge. Absolutely. Brilliant. Thanks for that, uh, Danielle. Um, Todd, you, you in your um, description of yourself, you describe yourself as a strategist and someone who looks at the strategy of the way things are going. So from a strategic perspective, do you predict new regulations like the California Consumer Protection Act moving nationwide across the U.S. in some form or other, but particularly in the wake of the European decision, European Union's decision not to honor the uh, data shield and the privacy shield and all the issues that have come out of the decisions from the European Court? Yeah, I, you know, absolutely. There's uh, certainly a, a movement underfoot in terms of adopting across uh, the country the CCPA type regulations and privacy uh, in general. Like I said, with the advent of um, more responsibility, more oversight requirements with data privacy officers and chief privacy officers, uh, setting new policy involving technology. Uh, understanding how the landscape of their brand reputation gets impacted by it, and also by obviously the regulated the regulators uh, and governments looking to protect the consumer, right? They're looking for more protection. So uh, these are things that I think are safe best to expect more of uh, as we go forward. And that I think some of the larger enterprises or the more mature organizations are being able to put funding and resources behind it. Uh, some of uh, the mid-market clientele that we talk to are certainly trying to get there, but they simply don't have the budget to put behind it, so they're trying to get ready the best they can. Uh, and these are challenges that we always see with, um, you know, CISOs or uh, any of the new regulations coming in is around how do we fund the automation or fund the process or fund the program amongst different initiatives. So, you know, we're always helping our uh, executives at our customers and prospects in terms of understanding uh, what those conversations need to be and how do you risk prioritize your budget spend every year because with the expectation that this just goes higher and higher year over year, uh, you've got to be able to risk rationalize the work effort you put behind it to make sure that you're focused on, uh, you know, not everything inside of every regulation but in the things that you do as a company aligned to what the regulation is uh, telling you and how you're going to be evaluated against it is really important to be able to refine that to the nature of your specific business. Yeah, and I, I mean, I certainly get the sense where uh, Daniela was talking about best of breed. I think the implication of best of breed in regulatory requirements is also out there. And, you know, you can see the influence of GDPR. You can see the influence of the California regulations impacting on other countries, taking up the best of them and, and spreading the word. So I, I think we're going to see more of that sort of uh, uh, leavening of the field in uh, commonality and regulation over time and it's something we've got to be prepared for and got to be prepared to deal with so thank you for that um, uh, Todd thank you uh, okay we're coming towards the end now um, so we're going to ask our audience um, ask our audience ask our panelists for their takeaways uh, so we're going to go around the table Dan I'm going to start with yourself could you give us uh, your takeaway recommendations uh, or any other closing remarks you have for today's listeners sir? absolutely so kind of the main takeaway that I share with our clients, partners, customers alike, um, 
don't be afraid to leverage third-party technologies, whether it's OneTrust or Process Unity. There's a bunch of different tools that are out there today that can be leveraged to help build that defined and repeatable process for the business to truly assess and understand the security posture of your third parties. Now, with that being said as well, I think this was Danielle that mentioned it earlier. So many organizations are still living through Excel spreadsheets, annual processes. Now, this does work to an extent by all means, but there does become that inflection point here to where you need to leverage purpose-built resources, educational content, real-time insights to really understand the usage of your third parties, potential breaches, incidents, especially with just the ever-changing privacy and regulatory environments here that could have significant impacts across your business, whether that's just domestically or, of course, looking more broadly at a global level. Thank you very much indeed, Dan. Um, over to you, Jason. What takeaway recommendations and final remarks do you have for today's audience? Sir? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's uh, it's just interesting to hear everybody's perspective on this and, and understand that, that none of us is alone, right? We're all. It all seems like we are trying to hit this moving target. And when I say moving target, there's lots of things shifting in front of us. Um, global pandemic, for one thing, uh, changes in regulations, dropping a privacy shield, all sorts of things that are impacting us. Um, it's interesting because this will sound sort of like a paradox, but really two things that are your friend in this situation are having some structure and predictability in your data, but also being able to be flexible and adjust, right? So being structured does not mean being rigid or overly rigid, but it also uh, doesn't mean that you have to be, you know, constantly flowing and changing. There is some value to, um, you know, the structure and, and predictability within your process and, and really knowing everybody's role in the process. And, and I really like what Danielle has been talking about in terms of that need to know. I know I've talked about it before, but making sure everybody understands their role, understands when they need to be involved, um, it, it really will create a, a very cohesive uh, environment and, and program for you. Thank you very much indeed. Todd, over to you, sir. Your closing thoughts, please. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, obviously, guys, you know, get started, right? If you don't have it, if it's in spreadsheets everywhere, you know, there's a way to get started. Uh, you know, like we talked about, you know, defining and knowing your organization, uh, baselining your program to know where you stand today, whether it's on privacy, whether it's on compliance, whether it's on third party risk program automation. Uh, knowing where you start is important and getting started. Uh, Knowing your organizational responsibility and having people that are stakeholders across a cross-functional group working together against a set, a set of data is really important. And there's a lot of ways that you can um, automate and, and increase the flow of information to the key people when they need to make decisions at the right time, right? Whether it's a contract renewal with a third party or onboarding or it's a, a high-value asset assessment that needs to have uh, funding go into it to remediate a gap. Uh, these things are important to have the timing and sequence and cadence correctly. And, and the last thing I'll leave you with, too, is that it doesn't all have to be, as we talked about today, uh, assessment-based, right? There are way, great ways to add uh, embedded intelligence into your program where you're performing continuous monitoring and you're having the data tell you when you need to look at something. These are things that are very real today and things that um, are available uh, to embed into your program so that you can scale and, and you know, as we just heard, do more with less. Thank you very much, Lee Todd. A pleasure to uh, share a conversation with you uh, again. Uh, and last but definitely not least, Danielle, what would you like to leave our listeners with today? Yeah, the thing that I'd like to say is just to, one, think about your end user. I'm really glad you asked that last question and the experience that you're giving them. They're going to, when we go back to, thinking about why we're collecting the data that we're collecting about end users. It's not just so uh, regulatory compliance can go smoothly. It's so you create a great user experience and you only collect the information that you need at the time that you need to collect it. And it does make sense to probably collect more information over time. Doing it all up front in that registration experience often doesn't make a lot of sense and it is not the best user experience. Um, and you obviously want to be protecting your consumers' privacy and identities as, as you're creating that sort of first interaction with your customer. And that brings me back to my last point, which is why we think identity is a really logical source of truth here. It is that gateway to your brand experience. It's the first time they interact. It's where 
a lot of people input a lot of information about themselves. It's uh, where the process all starts, and it kind of helps you tie everything together downstream when you're trying to map that data and execute on a regulatory request like data retrieval. Um, so we think about that as, as sort of a starting point, the framework, um, and uh, hopefully that, that gives people something to think about. Thanks, Colin. Thank you very much indeed, Daniel. That's superb. And thank you for my fellow panelists for an e excellent discussion. I think we've provided some reasonable insight about privacy and compliance in the shape of the pandemic. Kelly, over to you. Thanks, Colin, and I'll uh, second that. Thanks for a great discussion, everyone. Thank you to our attendees for your participation. Uh, please be sure to check out the additional supporting resources related to the topic on executiveitforms.org, and please watch your email for notifications on upcoming programs. For those of you who qualify for CPE credit, your certificate will be issued within 30 days. Our next CPE webinar is on August 27th, Executive Tips to Modernize Your Compliance Program. And you can reserve your seat now through the console. But before you do that, please do take a moment to leave us a rating and feedback for today's session. We value your feedback, and it helps when we are planning for future events. So that's it for now. I'd like to thank our speakers for your participation again, with a special thanks to our sponsors, OnSpring, OneTrust, Process Unity, and Okta, without whom this event would not be possible. And thank you again for listening. Please stay tuned for our next event, and have a great day, everyone.